So welcome everyone to this week's edition of Military Trailblazer Office Hours. Thanks so much for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to spend it here in the spirit of community, mentorship, and learning. I'm your host, Dave Nada. I'm ably assisted by David Albright, and we are lead solution engineers at Salesforce. We're both military trailblazers. Um, each week, we invite a co-host or co-host to take part in the conversation so we can leverage their experience, their expertise, and their unique perspectives. So I'm, I'm excited about this session. The focus is transitioning tips for crushing your first 90 days in the Salesforce ecosystem. So if you're looking for guidance on how to put your best foot forward when transitioning to a new professional path, this is the session for you. I want to take a moment to welcome and briefly introduce our co-host panel for tonight's session. We've got Justin Dunn, Kayla Greer, Ryan Howard Hall, Megan Hedrick, Nick Mayo, and Katrina Wilson. So Justin is a consultant on the managed services team at Sirius Solutions. He served in the Air Force for seven years and leveraged the Hiring Our Heroes Salesforce Fellowship to transition to tech just over a year ago. Kayla is an associate consultant at Slalom. She's a military spouse, has deep experience in language education, and also took advantage of the HOH Fellowship to launch her tech career. Ryan is a business analyst at Capgemini. He served as a civil engineer in the Air Force and Air Force Reserve, and has experience in sales, healthcare solutions, and project management. Megan's a consultant at White Label Group, also a Hiring Our Heroes Fellowship alum. She's a military spouse with previous experience in sales and business management. Nick's a senior consultant at Capgemini Government Solutions. He's an Army veteran, a Hiring Our Heroes Fellowship alum, there's a pattern here, and has previous experience in sales. And Katrina is an associate consultant at Optima. She has previous experience in healthcare and education as a military spouse and is passionate about business analysis and change management. It is awesome to have all of you co-hosting office hours with me. Welcome. Thanks for having us, David. Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. This has been in the books for a, for a long time, so I'm, <laughs> glad to, I'm glad to see it come to fruition. Um, so at this point, we typically invite our co-hosts to share their Salesforce stories, but we have seven folks or seven co-hosts on the call. So what we'll do instead is we'll be touching on them throughout tonight's session to ensure that we make time for everyone's questions. And so if you're joining for the first time, welcome. I always like to briefly explain the purpose of these office hours before we open the floor for questions and discussion, just to give you some context. So these sessions are an informal get together for gathering with military trailblazers as well as allies, everyone is welcome, to explore primarily non-technical Salesforce career and branding related topics so that you can achieve your professional development and career related goals and we can help you. The next hour is intended to be an opportunity for collaborative mentorship. So what that means is everyone on the call is encouraged to step up and both help ask and answer questions from your perspective, which of course provides additional diversity experience to the answers given. Do keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. I and others are gonna be posting a lot of great information. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, typically pull from LinkedIn to post trailhead quests, uh, employment opportunities, volunteer opportunities, knowledge articles, things of that nature. Also, feel free to exchange LinkedIn profiles. We are here to connect and learn. So let's connect with each other. If you wanna ask a question at any point during today's session, please feel free to do so. This is your session. If you don't feel comfortable speaking up, no worries, just post it in chat and I will do my best to monitor the chat window. And I'll also be looking for raised hands and we'll call on you in the order received. Finally, last bit of admin trivia. Tonight's session is being recorded. So if you wanna share an attribution free comment, let me know before speaking and I will make sure that my uh, expert editor edits it out of the final recording. All right, so I think we're all ready to go. Um, and we're gonna be touching on, you know, how to choose your professional path, how to select your transition tools, how to build your network, navigating the application process, strategies for onboarding, and really how to stand out in your role. That's where the bulk of the session will be. Um, so we'll get started with choosing a professional path. And this is, this like all questions I've got for you today is, is for the group. So uh, in no particular order, feel free to, to jump into it. But, you know, um, often the hardest question we face when we're entering a new industry is which path to pursue. I know that was the hardest for me. And this is especially challenging in the Salesforce ecosystem because there's so many different roles available. Can you each share with us what led you to your current path and any resources you leveraged to help narrow down those choices? Yeah. Who's going to go first? <laughs> you go, Nick. Somebody I'll go, go first. I don't care. I'll go first. Uh, so for me, um, I don't have like a hard technical skills background. I think like a lot of us probably don't. And we use the fellowship. Most of us, I think, use the fellowship as a program to break in and, and really figure out what we're good at. Um, for me, there was two things. It was figure out what I wanted to do, which is very, it's just really hard. It's one of the hardest things I think you, we have to do. 
because you have no clue. You don't really, you may know what you want to do, but you don't really know what that is. So the way that at least I've tried to figure out what I wanted to do is talk to people who are in the industry. Um, and that was for me, at least was mainly through Veterati having conversations with people um, who were in potential roles that I thought I might be interested in and learning about what they do. And then if it was something that I thought like, oh yeah, this seems pretty cool. It's, I could see myself doing this. I'd continue engaging people in that role. If it was something that I wasn't necessarily interested in, I'd quite frankly, just stop talking to those people. Um, and that's okay. That's what networking <laughs> and mentorship is about. Um, you find the right people to talk to so that you can get the most information for you to make a very informed decision so that you're happy during your transition. Um, that's what I did. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, and I think and I want to provide time for everyone else to go as well. But, you know, if you're not military focused and maybe Veterati is, is not uh, the platform for you, you know, what Nick is alluding to is, is informational interviews. And you don't have to be on Veterati to have those. Those can come from LinkedIn and you're just reaching out to folks and saying, hey, can I have 15 minutes of your time to talk about what you do? And there's very few people that don't like to talk about what they do that are going to turn you down. So, um, but it's a great way for, for picking where you want where you want to go, what you want to do. David, you're one of the first people I actually messaged when I was doing it, which is kind of funny because I had no idea, you know, I was messaging someone that had such impact in the ecosystem, but I just randomly reached out to David on LinkedIn and asked him a couple questions as I was trying to make the transition. And that really goes to show just how everybody in this ecosystem is just willing to help and just ask questions. We're here. Yeah, I would say that's like a pretty good, a pretty good point, Ryan. I'll just piggyback off that, I guess. It's like now I, I kind of, I don't know if I did it enough back when I was kind of deciding which way I was wanting to go. But now I'm thinking about like sometimes I'll get random messages from people like Ryan was mentioning, just asking about like tips for transitioning or roles in the ecosystem or asking about the company I work at, et cetera. I'm happy to field any, you know, I'll answer questions on LinkedIn all day. So I probably didn't do it enough, but if you're sitting there wondering, what is this company like? Or what does it, what does a managed services consultant do? Or what is it like being a consultant as your full-time job? Just sh send a message to that, person and like I feel like they're probably reply <laughs> I think it's important too to note that it looks different at different companies so if you go in thinking you want to be a BA or a solutions engineer like what does that look like at that company um, I have found that it's there's a, a, a wide variance there I absolutely agree. I, I spent a lot of time looking at job descriptions and seeing, okay, that's what a BA does there. That's what a CE is. And trying to align that with what people were telling me. Absolutely. Those informational interviews are so critical and just asking, hey, what's a day in the life like in your role? Please walk me through that so I can get a realistic understanding of what this may entail. So those are really helpful elements. I think that's a, a great point. Um, I recently was talking about this, about the issue with admin, business analyst, and consultant. It's kind of interchangeable, in, interchangeable you know? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's difficult, but I, I agree. Like learning more and asking questions during those interviews will really help you narrow down what exactly you are doing. Yeah, I would second a lot of what's already been shared, like the being a sponge and like, putting yourself out there, networking within your company or, or outside of your company, setting up those informational interviews and asking um, what makes that person that you're interviewing like passionate about what they're doing? Like, yes, like what do you do <laughs> throughout your day? But like, why, why are you doing it? How did you get to where you are? And what kinds of questions did you ask yourself? And as you're going through and being a sponge and figuring out what it is you want and what makes you passionate you can kind of start to match things that you you hear about these other people in those roles that's making them happy you're like oh well that's the kind of thing like i like putting puzzles together and i like thinking about problems from these different angles like so and that's matching what this person's maybe doing in their free time and i think um not being afraid as well to just try things out and being ready to, um, and, and focusing on it for, for giving a good chance. So like, I'm still doing this actually, like I'm looking into marketing cloud, for instance, and, and I'm just getting into it and, and I want to give it a, a good, a good run. And, and if it's not for me, for some reason, I'm loving it so far, but if it changes, then 
it's okay to change that path. Uh, we can't, we, we're not at risk, I think, of like getting in a pigeonhole situation. <laughs> um, there's lots of great paths you can go down and, and change it up. Thank you. Yeah, great, great points. And, and um, you know, to your point, Kayla, like we often ask at the end of episodes, at the end of sessions, you know, what's the best part of your day and why do you stick around in your role? And, it, and it's not a frivolous question. You know, it speaks to passion and, it's, and it speaks to, you know, um, trying to align people with roles that they can be excited about. And that, that question digs into it. So it's a great point. And then just something to touch on with what Jose said, a lot of companies will call the same role different things. Um, and that can be extremely confusing. Like, you know, when I started at um, Pulse Source, I was just, yeah. you know, I was a solution architect. I was like, okay, cool. That's what I am. And I had no idea. And when I went to interview at Salesforce, they're like, well, I said, you're not qualified um, to be a solution architect. We're not going to hire you. It's <laughs> like, but I was already doing it. Like, no. So there's there's different names for the same thing, which can be which can be confusing. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and set it a little mute here. There we go. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I um, I invited you know uh, a co-host panel, all of you folks from from different companies, so that um, to Megan's point, you can you can dive into what it's like at those different companies because she's absolutely correct. It, it is different. It's not the same. Um, but great points. Any any last thoughts before we we move on to the next topic? I just want to add on, in addition to what Kayla said there, that it's not really in this ecosystem. It's not so much of a ladder as it is a jungle gym. You can go a lot of different ways, and they all connect really nicely. And so even if you do land in a role that like, oh, maybe this isn't for me, that role will still help inform other roles that you may pursue. So it's really wonderful in that way. I think that there's a very that. simple fork. Oh, sorry, I think there's a very simple oh, fork. Will you be writing code or not? <laughs> if that's a no, it's going to simplify a lot. Like you can start up an admin, you know, VA consultant. Do you want to go with the um, individual clouds, right? Sales cloud, um, other niche ones like commerce clouds, etc. Do you want to go with the full-on architect right, uh, route, right? If not. Um, are you looking at integrations, MuleSoft, or what? You like project management. You know, like there's just tons of ways, but usually an admin slash BA is a great starting point. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the that's one of the first questions I ask folks is um, when they're like, hey, what's Salesforce about? What should I do? I'm like, well, do you want to be technical or non-technical? Let's start at the top and kind of work our way down to to quote Katrina, the jungle gym, which is an awesome analogy because it it totally is. It's the, it's not a linear path. Um it, you can go sideways, you can go backwards, up and down. Um, so um, that's how I, I structure that conversation and, and, it, and it, I find it's helpful. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on. So, so selecting transition tools, right? So uh, many of you harness the Hiring Our Heroes Salesforce Fellowship to gain both training and work experience. Awesome program. What other tools or resources or programs played a role in enabling your transition during your initial months in the ecosystem? YouTube. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's a big learning resource. I already kind of alluded to it. Um, I used Veterati quite a bit for mentorship and just information gathering. Um, that was the biggest thing for me, I think. So Udemy and, of course, Google and YouTube are, um, everybody uses those. But Udemy has some great courses if you want to drill down on specific skills. Apex yeah, Plural site is also yeah. great. Oh yeah. And so, um, you know, to, to to the earlier point, YouTube's a fantastic resource. Obviously, I've got a YouTube channel, but so many other Salesforce professionals out there have YouTube channels um, with lots of great content, whether you want to be technical or not. Um, and so, again, if you know, if you're looking for mentorship and and you're and you you're, you, may, you may not be a military member. Um, you know, there's the Trailblazer Connect program uh, that Trailhead offers to connect uh, with mentors, but also like LinkedIn is a, is a great tool to, you know, it may not be structured specifically to, con you know, to connect you with only mentors, but you can certainly create mentorship relationships through your interactions that you have on there. And I've done that a number of, uh, a number of times, uh, and it's been really helpful for my career. So a lot of, a lot of great tips there. Anything else? Any other, any other resources or programs that stand out to you? Yeah, I so, to... yeah. oh. so uh, going real back real quick, I learned this 
into like a little bit into using Udemy, but if you are a military spouse, you can get a free Udemy business account. And so you won't be paying for a lot of those courses that can cost quite a bit. Um, you sign up through my Seco. Um, somebody here probably has a, a link they can share, but um, definitely tap into that resource. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Suggest, There's uh, a lot of. Sorry, go ahead. I would suggest uh, the Pathfinder program. There's also the Salesforce Talent Alliance, and probably the best resource is the Salesforce Certification Days. Uh, they usually give out some pretty good discounts. We're talking like $140 off your cert. So realistically, like you could pay your retake with that. Now they are launching their um, uh, sessions for March, but it's only $40. But still, like if you're preparing for a cert. You watch that four hour session, like you're probably really uh, well off. Yeah, certification days is phenomenal. Um, and, and I've used that several times just to get a, an overview of, of what you should be focusing on during the course and kind of get a, a course correction if you're missing specific topics. Awesome. I would, I would say the Trailblazer, like the Trailhead Military Office Towers were huge. Um, yeah. support network wow. like learning like hearing from people who are, had already been in it like getting to pick their brains and see just like a variety of different uh presenters um linkedin was mentioned like that was instrumental in being able to connect to people um and progress forward and candorful um those practice interviews uh, i think i did like three or four of them had so much great feedback it really helped me hone in um those those interview skills much better like going into it um increasing my chances to be matched with a host company so i definitely want to shout out to those now and i did not pay kayla to plug uh, military trailblazer office hours that came like un unprompted but but to her point like Obviously, the Trailblazer community is a huge resource. Um, that's how I got started with my, my my connections was the Boston Salesforce Saturday Group. Um, and back, you know, before we had the pandemic, you could you could attend in person, and you can you can these days too. But um, and that was a great way just to meet mentors. And to that point, like um, and I was talking about this before the call started, I met Mark Baseman, um, who you know was was an Advent evangelist at the time at Salesforce, and he introduced me to Jillian Bruce, and Jillian Bruce runs the Salesforce Advents podcast, and so that was huge exposure for me, and it all came because he's a member of that group, I was a member of that group, and we were attending the same events in Boston, um, and you know, fast forward to last week, and you know, we had tacos in San Diego. So you know, these these mentors that you meet in seemingly random locations can help you for the rest of your career, and and. But you got to put yourself out there. You have to attend sessions, you, and not just this one. Obviously, uh, community sessions in general, user groups, um, both in person and uh, online, to get the best mix of folks, and just pull mentors from each of those groups as they become available. Uh, you should never have one mentor. Have as many as you can, and as many as you have time for. Um, so I see that uh, social dilemma has a hand raised. Go ahead and uh, proceed, sir, with your question or comment. Uh, yeah, I just noticed that since a lot of you have uh, experience with the HOH program, if you had any advice on uh, you know, how to prepare, basically. Great question. Yeah, um, I guess I'm going to start speaking to that. I mean, just really quick, because I don't want to get you know too off the rails with the making a higher heroes talk. But um, I think the main thing is like, for me, obviously, it's going to be veterans transitioning service members and spouses with an admin cert pretty much uh so like kayla was saying a good way to stand out would be like prepared in your interviews of course it's good to have more certs possibly maybe you'll have app builder maybe you'll have a ba cert or a uh, associate cert as well but i often found oftentimes found that going into the interviews they were kind of like personality screenings where they didn't really ask me any technical questions about salesforce uh ever actually uh or uh, you know, they didn't ask me to make an object or a report. Uh, I think they were just trying to get a sense of how I was as a person and if I'd be like decent to work with. Because yet again, it's going to be mostly the aforementioned audience with an admin cert. So not that many people stick out. Let's be honest. It'll, so I think it's mostly how you are. Uh, just an opinion. But. There's three things yeah, that really important. Justin. I tell everybody this: they're looking for someone that they can work with that's going to fit into their team's culture. There's they're looking for somebody that they can teach. And the most important thing is they're looking for somebody they can put in front of a client. 
And if you can check all three of those boxes when you do your interview, I mean, that that's it. It's that simple. Excellent. hundred uh, percent. Megan, question or comment from you. Hey, how's it going guys? So I've kind of like thrown myself into this in the last like month and a half, two months. I already got my first salesman ad cert or Salesforce admin cert just like a few days ago. Then um, I'm trying to get on the HOH fellowship, which I'm supposed to know about it in a day or so. I'm not holding my breath. I saw the percentages, okay? But moving forward, so I keep hearing about the Salesforce associate uh, associates, and I'm trying to figure out if that's something that I should also tap into. I've also already started the Salesforce advanced admin as well, but then I'm also looking at, I saw the net zero, which really interests me. So going forward, if I don't get this, but I am looking for work, what should I be focusing on and what can I do to, I, I get it, you know, the personality makes yourself stand out, but I need people to look at my paperwork. So what's going to draw them with my paperwork? That's a, That's a lot. great I'm question, sorry. and I'll, I'll turn it over to the panel, and then we'll have uh, Jose's comment as well. So, uh, panel, you get first uh, grabs. Then. Thanks. Can I grab it first? So, I got my first two roles from networking. I didn't do anything special. It's just from networking, and I was off LinkedIn and through this community. So, whatever that means to you, it works for me. So, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, certifications are a great, great way to show that you're learning and you're interested in specific products that Salesforce offers, but they're definitely, as somebody who has more than I probably should, um, <laughs> quite honestly, um, it's not an end-all be-all. They don't, they don't make you an expert. It's a kind of a baseline level knowledge, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you could deliver quality solutions just because you have a certification. It shows that you're interested and it shows that you have the aptitude to learn something. Um, so I would recommend um, probably App Builder because it builds on admin the best for non-technical coder folks. Um, or just pick something you're interested in and just run with it and see where it goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because that's my biggest thing. It's like I'm putting in for all these things, but I don't actually feel qualified. Like I understand the basics. Like I get how it works. I can pass the test. I can go through. I can finish the modules. But it's like how do you put yourself out there like, hey, hire me. I've been doing this for two months not even two months. You know what I mean? Like, I feel kind of imposter syndrome. Like, we all have that. I'll let you know a little secret. We feel that every day. Probably 75% yeah. of the work I get, I don't know how to do. Yeah. And we want YouTube comes in. And well, then it's about being able to look at, look for those resources and problem solve. That's a big part of being in the Salesforce ecosystem is just the fact that you know what to do when you don't have the answer. You're not expected to have every single answer. Yeah, my friend. So yes. I, hope, I refuse <laughs> to put it up there. <laughs> exactly. 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 And then if you want to really pump up your resume, I'd say looking into volunteer work would be helpful. Catch a fire, several others upwork. I know when they have you apply for the HOH program, they usually send you a pretty awesome info sheet in an email that lists out a couple of opportunities you can use to your advantage. So that would help as well. And a few companies have their own boot camp and onboarding. So they know that you're coming in green. And if you, you know, pass the I like to work with you phase of your interview, then they have a good, reliable admin training program to onboard with. I know Booz Allen is one. Um, there's a there's a list of them. Yeah, I did oh, not know about the onboarding things with all the companies. I just just started hearing about that like in the last two days. Yeah. Awesome. I would add on like Those super are... badges as well. Yeah. Um, because if you're looking for like a, a, to build your confidence and um, get more like hands on experience, like building something, um, sorting out from the instructions, like what gleaning like oh okay what is this asking me to do and how can i actually go in and apply that super badges are really a really great way to do that and uh stand out um as as certifications do i'd offer a couple of thoughts so you, you mentioned you're you're applying for hiring our heroes and and iris will correct me if i'm wrong but typically hiring our heroes aligns you with consulting roles in the partner ecosystem and so 
if, uh, if you're going into that program with that assumption, then you probably want to follow the natural progression of certs that are going to be um, intuitive for that for that uh, field. So admin is, is the perfect start, right? It's, it's the gateway uh, cert into all the other certs. Um, I think Nick brought it up, Platform App Builder uh, is phenomenal and you'll use that every single day from building apps, App Builder, App Manager, um, to all the process automation. It is the cert that, where I learned the most um, and I, I used it today. Um, so that's great. Um, and then, you know, majority of the consulting firms, you're going to be doing either sales or service and or experience cloud. Um, and so, or, de or derivations thereof. So those are great certs. To your earlier question about Salesforce Consultant, I think the value in Salesforce Consultant is, mm, do I know if I want to go into this ecosystem? Let me just sample and see what it's like. Let me get my first cert, get my toes wet. You know, if you already have admin cert, it'd be going backwards in my opinion. Um, to Nick's point, like there's looking good on paper and then there's looking good, you know, um, in person when you're actually doing the work. And lots of, or I won't say lots, some folks look great on paper, they have tons of certifications, they can't code or, or configure very well, they just take tests really great. Um, so you wanna make sure that you look good on paper, but you also look good in person. And right or wrong, looking good on paper, part of that is earning certs. And, and right or wrong, if you have 25 certs, you're gonna get looked at harder than a person who has two certs, um, you know, which is, does it, it does not necessarily um, mean that you're more or less qualified if you have more certs. I've known folks that I have more certs in and they can, you know, they can blow me out of the water with, with their capabilities. Um, but it's something, it's something to think about. So later, if you want to go back and earn that Salesforce, you know, uh, associate to plus up your on paper look, great, you know, go for it. Plus, it's, it's a fun cert to take. Um, I guess I should specify to get the first look. I wanted the paper work. Not like I understand that there's lots of people who have doctorates that I wouldn't trust to like run my equipment. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I, yeah. I get it. I think, you know, for the program for hiring or hairs, you have to have the admin. I started to notice that I was getting more attention when I had like three certs because, you know, it, it, folks can earn a cert and it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to dive into that ecosystem, like maybe a one off. But once you start, you know, second, third, fourth, people are like, okay, this person's passionate about continuous learning. They're going somewhere and it shows that you're, you know, that you um, are mastering the content. And the last thing I'll say, then I promise I'll be quiet, is um, I think you had brought up uh, was the, oh, so how do you get experience, you know, when no one will hire you without work experience? Um, Kayla, great point about super badges. They just redesigned the whole program. So there's a ton more out there and they're, they're uh, more user friendly, we'll say. Uh, so you can earn them a bit quicker um, and they're more bite-sized, which is what Trailhead's all about. But I would say get a free dev org, you know, go go to go to you know salesforce.devorg.com and and um, and build apps. That's that's how. Not only is is that going to teach you um, how to solve problems, but when you're at a job interview, like if you pull out your iPad or or your your laptop and you show them apps you've built, which I have actually done during an interview with Salesforce, um, it makes a huge impact. So um, I want to want to call in Jose because he's been patiently waiting uh, with a question or comment. And you are muted, sir. So how's Jose, it, how's you're, you're on mute right now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted go. to say that um, I was actually part of the team that developed the associate, sir. So it's definitely a step down from the admin. You know, like you're not really proving anything to yourself or to others if you're doing it in that order. But personally, and you know, I would want to hear from the rest of you, from my perspective, I don't apply for jobs anymore. If my LinkedIn is optimized well enough, people just reach out to you. So having that two times, three times certified in your headline honestly makes a ton of difference. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and and quick segue, that, that was my goal when I was transitioning from the military. I don't want to apply for jobs. I want companies to come to me. And it seems like, oh, you know, like how, how do you do that? Like you can do it. It's not hard. It's all about networking, which is a fantastic segue for my next question. Um, couldn't have been planned better. So each journey is obviously unique. Everyone creates these moments of connection in slightly different ways. I, I would love to hear from the panel. What are some networking words of wisdom you could pass on to those just beginning their journey? Uh, I could take this first because I did way more networking than I would care to share. Um, the biggest thing I think, and this goes back to what I said earlier, know what you want. Um, and if you don't know what you want, know the questions to ask to kind of be able to figure it out. 
not everybody you talk with is going to have the skills or the mentorship capability to be able to ask you tough questions to help you figure that out. Some people just want to be able to have conversations with you. But if you're looking for something specific, it helps if you can bring what that is to the table. And like I said, if you don't know what that specific thing is, have a pretty robust list of questions to ask people so you can figure that stuff out. Because otherwise, you're just going to be talking in circles about stuff that, quite frankly, doesn't really matter to both of you. Um, so make sure your your informational interviews and your sessions are very intentional. Nick, I completely agree. I think there's the networking etiquette, you know, just having a really good and efficient session with someone that's authentic is so important. I actually have an informational interview template that I'll fall back on if we can't find the topics or we, you know, get off in the woods there. But I think if you prep the person that you're meeting with as well, give them an idea of the concepts you want to discuss, any potential questions in advance, they can come to that meeting and have answers at the ready that they know you want to talk about. And also just make it an authentic communication. If you, you know, connect with someone on LinkedIn and don't include a note, or you show up and you're not actively listening, or even I've had some folks meet with me and they've just not even seemed interested. And I understand everyone's busy, but you want this to be a real connection and to value each other's time. And sending a thank you note afterwards, it speaks volumes. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I think I had someone, not literally, but sometimes it feels like people just message you on LinkedIn. They'll be like, how do I get a job in Salesforce? It's like, okay, first, hi. You know, yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> maybe have some questions in the intro message or even just ask for my time. Maybe like you want to talk about the fellowship, you want to talk about transitioning uh, veterans benefits and you want to talk about, I don't know, you know, transitioning, like I said, and getting the civilian or, you know, anything else. Then I can be like, oh, sure, I'll help you out. But uh, kind of just immediately starting with a request is a little bit uh, faux pas, in my opinion. Yep, hundred percent. You got to you got to provide context, and and you have to um, you know you're building a relationship. So you wouldn't just walk up to somebody like at the mall and be like, "Hey, how do I get a job at Salesforce?" Like that'd be weird. So you shouldn't do that online either. You know, manners manners are manners everywhere. All right. Any final thoughts on that topic before we move on? Katiana, question or comment from you? I just have a quick question on how you nurture relationships with recruiters and hiring managers in the long run. Um, that's one thing I'm having trouble right, with right now as I'm searching. So I have had a few recruiters that I've spoken with on LinkedIn and um, I am quite content where I'm at right now, but I also know that you don't know what the future holds and I, respond to their messages and um, I thank them for reaching out and I tell them that I'm content where I'm at right now, but that I'd love to keep in touch um, and get to know each other better. And it's worked out really well. I've had a few um, video meetings and I think that they also appreciate um, our reply. So I just uh, respect them by writing back and acknowledging what they're doing as well. And, and so just a quick tip, because, um, you know, Megan, Megan has an absolutely awesome point. Um, you don't know where you're going to be. Uh, like, who knew there'd be a market you know, downturn um, in, in CRM right now, um, where folks are, you know, some folks are struggling to find work. You don't know that. So you always have to be, always have to be networking, always have to be branding. Um, and if you're comfortable in the position and you're secure and, and you, you're not looking to go anywhere, it's an excellent opportunity when a recruiter hits you up or a hiring manager to refer one of your connections who you know is looking or who may be looking. Not only does that make you a hero in that person's eyes because you're hooking them up, but it, it also creates a favorable impression with that recruiter or hiring manager. Um, so it's, it's a win-win. Iris, question or comment? Hello, can everyone hear me? Good. Yep. Okay, sorry about my voice. Um, it's allergies. I promise I've not been yelling at my kids or anything like that, first of all. <clears throat> but it's so great to see you guys here and see you guys shaping your success, watching your careers has been so wonderfully exciting. How would you advise those coming into the ecosystem now 
being new with the turbulence in the markets right now do you have any advice because i love everything that you're saying but it's kind of been said before and i think people are looking for new ways to you know find that career sorry to be the one to give you the tough questions <laughs> great question <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't expect it from anyone else. I would say cast your net as far as you can. Um, Salesforce doesn't need to be the only thing that you do for the rest of your life. It's at the end of the day, it's software, it's information technology, it's consulting, it's whatever you're interested in. So cast it wide and cast it far. Um, you you don't need to, like I said, Salesforce doesn't need to be the thing forever. Um, and if it is right now, that's fine. If it isn't right now, that's fine too. If it is later, because you want to go back to it, that's fine too. But keep your options and keep your opportunities open because you you never really, you don't know what's out there until you start looking for things. Like even being employed now in the Salesforce space and looking at the other areas in my company, I'm like, oh, I'm pretty interested in cloud products now or data analytics tools or other things that I didn't even know were a thing. So. And the way you do that is you talk to people who do it. 100%. Love that. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, oh, did someone have a comment? That was Iris, Dave. Oh, okay. I was just saying thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, so um, it's a great topic and it's very, uh, very fitting for the current times. I, I would say. Uh, and this is going to appear to be broad, but like make yourself indispensable. So from day one, you need to, you know, be looking at, you know, how do I make myself um, into the employee that they don't want to fire uh, or lay off, right? Uh, and, and and seriously, like if if your skill sets are the same as everybody else's, and you bring the same level of work to the job every single day as everybody else does, what differentiates you from your peers? And then when there is a market downturn and they have to let folks go. Why wouldn't they cut you, right? So you have to um, add extra value, and that, that can come in, in many different ways. Um, so you know, for me, early on, I I was the the guy getting up at three a.m. Uh, when I was a consultant, and I was starting my workday at like three thirty, and I had you know two, three, four, five user stories done before my the rest of my team woke up, and that's what I was known for. They wake up and go, oh, holy cap, that that's that's complete, awesome, and so client loved me because they're getting a ton of value. And yeah, was I working more than 40 hours? 100%. Was I claiming it? Nope. Um, but, you know, push comes to shove if, and it didn't end up happening, if they needed to cut some folks, they probably weren't going to cut me because I was the guy getting up at 3 a.m. to do stuff that no one else wanted to do. So do something that no one else wants to do. Do something that no one else knows how to do. And to that last point, you know, create a niche for yourself. If, if you're a consultant and, you know, um, you're looking for ways to, dramatically uh, alter the visual interface of Salesforce with clicks and not code, be an Omni Studio expert. Learn how to create flex cards and Omni scripts. And, and if no one else knows how to do that, are they gonna let you go? Probably not, right? Because that's, that's that niche. So you're doing something that no one else knows how to do. Um, Dave, uh, over to you and then we'll get Jose. Yeah, so, you know, if, if you do config, right, if you do consulting in Salesforce, right, you're kind of tied to the platform a little bit. Like Nick said, you can you can start to transfer, right? You start, start showing um, interest in analytics, things like that. Um, and you can start going the data analytics route. One thing to think about if you're if you're nerdy and you kind of like that dev route, you start teaching yourself the code. If you get the basics of coding, you can transition that, right? All you're doing is learning the language of whatever you're going to and if you're like for instance apex right that is very close to java and you can kind of go from one to the other like your web components uh, are based off of front end right javascript html css so if that's something that interests you start getting into that and there, there are definitely paths to go that route but that's one way to kind of uh maybe future proof yourself right if for instance and the ecosystem is not going away but we know there's a downturn even if Salesforce folded today, if you had a dev background, you could switch languages and go another route too. So that, that's another thing to think about. 
Yeah, it's a great point. And, and I know, David, you're working on code like every morning when we have our, our chats. Um, and even if you don't end up using it in the performance of your duties, I guarantee you, if you know how to code, it's going to make you a better consultant. It's going to make you a better admin. It's going to make you a better solution architect because you have a better appreciation for what they do. And you know the boundaries for where config ends and coding begins, and you can better navigate those. Um, Jose. Yeah, and now that you added that in the chat, that's absolutely true. CPQ is definitely one of the hottest, like, uh, sub products available um yeah there's definitely a surplus of salesforce professionals you know there's not enough jobs for everyone coming into the market so you really need to differentiate differentiate yourself so based on my perspective field service cpq commerce cloud salesforce industries marketing cloud that's kind of where you want to go because being realistic i don't really see two three years from now people hiring someone with exclusively knowledge on sales or service cloud. So find your niche, own it, and you should be fine. Yeah, awesome points, Jose, thank you. Amber, over to you. Hey guys, so many good friends to see again. So I love Wednesdays. Um, my question is this, I've been seeing a lot of uh, Scrum and Agile. So coming in like the first 90 days or prior to that, Right. Do you have any recommendations? Um, there's a lot of certs out there, especially for military uh, community. Are there a couple that you've seen that are valued or just getting an overview? And how is that speaking in during an interview or speaking with that, you know, coming in? So just kind of wanted to see what your thoughts are. Uh, most commonly, you'll probably see PSM or um, the other one by Scrum, CSM by Scrum Alliance. Uh, basically, what it, it just shows you have a fundamental understanding of agile methodologies to a certain degree. Um, whether you have that certification or not, if you're in a consulting environment, if you're on a development team, you're going to pick those fundamentals up very, very quickly. Um, that's probably, that's generally why you see a lot of people get that certification is because once you've been on an agile team, you can probably go sit for that cert and pass it with flying colors. Um, so really it's just, it's just teaching you the fundamentals of agile. So if you don't know anything about it coming in, it, it may be, it would probably be substantially more difficult to obtain that. But if you've been in and been on a team, then it'd be pretty easy to pick up. I don't I don't know that there's an industry preferred one. I don't think there is. Some companies may prefer you to get one over another. Uh, but outside some people of that, do PSM. Yeah. Yeah. Some people will be Scrum Master over like the PMP. Some people will get your PMP over the Scrum Master. Depending on what your company operates in, there's different versions of Agile as well. So I kept Gemini, we're really big on scaled agile. And it's just, it's all dependent on what they do, but just understanding the basic premise of agile, which is just basically letting your team dictate the work and looking at Jira, getting an understanding of Jira because everybody uses Jira. If you can have just that baseline understanding, you'll be good to go. Going beyond that, don't worry about that. You're putting the cart before the horse. You'll get all that stuff as you get into the ecosystem. And that's not as valued as high as some people might think, unless you are trying to be a scrum master, you're trying to be a project manager, then it's a little bit different. But you would want experience, obviously, before you dove headfirst into a role that you don't know how to do. So that's my two cents. Yeah, it's a good point. And it seems like regardless of the certification you take, each company does does Agile slightly differently. Um, and they have their own hybrid version. So um, as long as you understand the basic principles, um, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, I do want to uh, break uh, right now for our, our group photo. We're a little bit late on that because this has honestly been a, a really fun chat. Um, so if you want to participate, you can. If you don't want to, no worries there. Um, but we'll take an opportunity for those who do to unmute your video. I'll grab a picture, and then we can always be branding by sharing it on social media. And then we'll jump back into the questions. We've got lots more to go. All right, and so if we would if we would um, pause on the messages because when you when you post a message it covers my face and I want to be in the picture too. So, all right, I'll give you a count of three, and three, two, one, go. All right, success. Just downloading that real quick while I had bandwidth. You never know when you're on the road. All right, so I want to dive back into the questions. Um, and you know, we were kind of dancing around this, um, and so it's good that another great segue, um, how to stand out, right? We were talking about how to stand out in your role, but, but really before you get to your role, you know, there's thousands of candidates that enter the tech workforce every month. Uh, there's a limited number of roles. Um, to Jose's point, there, there is a lot of roles, but right, they're, they're not gonna hire absolutely everybody. So it makes sense then that 
learning how to stand out during the application process is in and of itself a critical skill. Um, so how, how did you approach your interviews to ensure that you stood out is the question. Yeah, so I think like, so the question, David, like you're saying, standing out in the interviews and how to, how to approach the interviews, I think kind of one of the main ways I did specifically is, um, you know, if you can get a job description, this applies to really not just the fellowship, obviously, this is like any job, right? So if you get the job description, uh, what I did was I kind of took, because I was in the military, um, so I took like my performance reports and then I kind of matched items in my history that I had done that I thought felt close enough to the job description that they were talking about. And so I like pasted the job description into a Notion document and then like put in my report like lines so like I could reference it in the interview how like I specifically did something that tied into the job description of the position. So like you could do that for any job or the fellowship as well, right? Because like you might not think I don't have fellowship or uh, Salesforce experience, but you might somehow in some way have consulting experience or working with deadlines or funds or uh, a client or a senior management like high enlisted or high officer people in the military just for that example specifically, right? And so you could tie in your experience to uh, those kind of stakeholders in, in these other jobs, I, I think. It's, 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 it's a good point. Um, translating those skills for sure. Megan had a, a funny but but a valid point um, about chat GPT. Um, by all means, you know, if, if you want to use that tool to inform the questions you ask, um, it's a tool, right? Just don't tell them you're using it, obviously, because if you've seen the news, uh, some, some folks are using it and, and then telling people about it for sensitive things they shouldn't. Um, and then don't rely on that solely, right? So it, it should inform your process. It shouldn't be your process. Um, but what else, what, what other uh, thoughts does the, the panel had out there for, for standing out during that application process? I think a little more, just peeling the layers back a little bit, but a little more basic, um, just being on time, being early, actually not being on time. Cause as somebody who's done interviews for my company, some people don't show up or they show up late. And when you have a competitive landscape, that could very well be something that eliminates somebody from being chosen. Um, so just standard interview etiquette is a lot more important than I think people give it credit for, um, having looking professional, having, you know, nice, nice top on, no one cares about your bottom half. You've heard it all before. Um, those things actually do matter because like I said, it's a competitive landscape. There's a lot of people you're going up against and the things that everybody is going to do, at least you think they're going to do that are easy wins for you, like dressing nicely, speaking clearly asking engaging questions, at least acting the part for the 30 minutes to an hour you may be talking with somebody. Those things are important and they might not seem like it as you're doing it, but when it comes down to you all have the same certifications and the same skills, well, Katrina was super pro professional and Justin <laughs> wasn't, um, that's, it's very important. So just don't take that stuff lightly. Yeah, for sure. And, and during that process, don't, don't forget to be yourself too. Right, because um, uh, you know you don't want to show up as, as as someone you think they want. Uh, they hire you based upon the person they think they're getting. Then when you actually bring your real self to work, uh, it doesn't go so well. So be yourself, you know, um, and and have fun during the process. Any other thoughts? Couldn't agree more with everything that's been said. Um, I'll put put a plug in for Candorful again. But even if you don't do that, like practice, like practice before going into the interview, um, so that you can. Like if you have some anxieties, it's normal. Uh, there's a lot on the line <laughs> for your interview sometimes. But um, but practicing helps already having in mind um, some situations that you can um, pull from whenever you're asked these like behavioral type questions, like put in the situation, how did you react to this? Um, there's a, I think a method called the STAR method, but I always forget, but it's something like with situation the actions you took and then the results that happened. So having already in, in your mind a few situations that you can pull from um, in the interview is really helpful and being concise with, okay, what, what, don't forget to get to the results part because <laughs> if you're like me, you can get caught up in the, the details of the situation part. Um, so make, making the actions and results stand out, be yourself, ask lots of questions, like come prepare, like do your research on the company like similar to how you would be with a client 
later on, like knowing who they are and what they're doing and why you want to be there and making that very clear um, and show, showing up and being professional and all of those, those things. Yeah, those are, those are all great points for sure. Um, I, I do want to make some time for the, for the meat of the session, which is like, you know, once you get into the role, how do you stand out? So for the next 10 minutes or so, as, as we, as we finish up, I um, want to um, pose a couple of questions there. So first culture, right? So if you've listened to, to Brett Taylor or um, to Mark Benioff, um, they're always talking about how culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, so it's, it's not really surprising then that, you know, companies, many companies make a really concerted effort to develop cultures that speak to their corporate values. That's how they retain people. That's how they attract people. Um, can you share your insight into how, how best to explore, support, and most importantly, contribute uh, to a company's culture um, during your first 90 days? Well, and part of that is, is bringing your authentic self to work, right? So how do you contribute to? Yeah. I'd say you really need to send your very best memes in the Slack channels that you're involved with. I'm sorry. I had to. <laughs> so <laughs> um, at least where I am, I, I really appreciated many elements of the culture because they emphasize things that I think are prevalent in the military community, grit and resiliency, and just volunteering and giving back to the community. And so if you plug in, they oftentimes do have Slack channels or what have you in that company that you can get involved in right away. So I plug straight away into the volunteer channel, into the memes channel, into the military channel, and try to get to know people because then you can get outside of your department and you can understand, okay, this company as a whole is compri comprised of these groups and I can really connect with these folks and understand them holistically that way. So. That helped me at least. Awesome. Yeah, with what our thoughts? like no know, knowing the culture and the values in our in my company, like it's it's very clear. Uh, they are very communicated. So like digging into what those mean, asking coworkers, asking your leaders, um, what values. Um, resonate with them and why because it could it could be very different for for different perspectives and and gaining that's really really valuable um thinking about uh feedback you would give others like looking at role models and mentors and how they're living those values and how you can you can set goals and and uh, work towards those as well and reading whatever feedback you get <laughs> in your team and looking at okay are the are there these values, are they matching up? Um, yeah, that's it. what I'll add. No, that's great, Kayla. And, and, you know, Rebecca's comment about volunteering ties in directly with what you're just saying about, you know, figure out what matters to the company. And then, you know, in, intrinsically, like if it matters to the company, it should matter to you. And how can you best support that? So, you know, Rebecca says volunteer. It's a great, great tip. Um, most companies have some arm of volunteering or they have employee resource groups um, that get together, you know, volunteer to, to chair one of those groups or at least be active in one. Uh, it's a great, great opportunity to stand out and support that culture. Any other thoughts before we, we move on to the next topic? All right. So uh, I'm just going back to my list here, uh, which I did not use chat GPT to create. Um, but uh, it's, it's a thought. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I know like ha having been a consultant for, for a couple of years um, and the same can be said for really any job you're starting um, from scratch, there's all these things coming at you and you have so much information to process uh, and it can be overwhelming. So, you know, you have to, you know, you have to know agile and you have to, you know, you have to know the subject matter and you got, you're trying to remember people's names and you're trying to learn about the culture. How did you approach setting and achieving your professional goals during your first 90 days? So in other words, how did you sort through all that stuff you have to know, prioritize it and go, okay, I'm gonna spend this much time doing this, this much time doing this, and then I'm gonna create some goals to do this, this, and this. Finding a mentor is probably the best thing you can do right out the gates. <clears throat> and I mean, there's gonna be tons of people who you work with, especially when you get placed on your first project, if it's within that first 90 days, <clears throat> excuse me, that as you show that you're willing to try whatever or just jump into whatever even if you don't know what you're doing you show them a willingness to learn and just a good positive can-do attitude 
people are naturally going to gravitate to you and they're naturally going to want to mentor you because they're going to leave you to do things. You're going to fail. They're then going to show you how to do it and how you react and how you control how you basically go forward from that situation. That's going to lead to somebody wanting to mentor you. So if you can just do that, you know, just good, positive, can-do attitude, you're going to crush it. Yeah, mentors are huge for sure. We have really um, we have uh, check-ins at work and uh, one-on-one check-ins. And it's nice because if you're working on a project that uh, you need feedback on, you can get feedback from someone who's been doing that for a while, whether it's a flow or um, anything else, just having someone um, uh, constructive criticism, if you will, or just guiding you and helping you to get better and being okay with um, not doing it right the first time and um, asking for help. Those are all things that add to succeeding in your first 90 days. Great tips. And I think to piggyback on that, I'll go ahead. I was say, and Ryan just put something in the chat. I think generally it's always a good good practice to try and figure things out yourself first, obviously, before you ask for help. But also on another note is have like a it's harder in a virtual environment, obviously, but having like a, a close like friend or a work a work pal basically who you can ask those stupid silly questions that you may be too prideful to ask somebody else on your team just so you can you know and it could be somebody who's a peer it could be somebody who's not a peer but building those really it all comes back to building relationships and being comfortable asking for help and questions yeah so battle buddy is a concept yeah. that many are familiar with um you know i i i call it my brain trap uh, and, and David Albright, I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but you, you're part of my brain trust. So like we'll chat back and forth in the morning, uh, you know, some complaining, some some informing and some some question asking. But you know, if you're coming in with a group of folks that are all having the same experience, like put together, you know, just it can be as formal or informal as you want. It can be a Slack message once a week or like, hey, you know, what's going on? Or it can be a, a, a Google meet or, a, you know, a Zoom meeting for 30 minutes on a Friday as you're having a, a beverage of your choice but have those connection points because it helps with everything. It helps with mentorship, right? It helps with networking. It helps with questions that you don't really, you know, um, know the answer to. Um, and then the more of those brain trusts or those battle buddies that you have, you can reach out to, um, you know, when you get stuck. So great, great point, Nick and, and Megan. Something that I use a lot of. I really uh, uh, liked what... Go ahead what Ryan had said too about like finding that mentor being so important um, because they can see a bigger picture and they can help you find your focus as well and 90 days might seem like a long time but it's such such a brief amount of time and it helps to kind of know one my 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 mentor and manager has told me many times pick one thing <laughs> and focus on that one thing um, and that's really, really, really sometimes very hard to do. So uh, definitely find find that person to help you with your weaknesses. Yep, I've got that person in my uh, in my um, in my work as well. So another awesome tip. We've got just about two minutes left. Um, so I want to ask one more question. Um, there's there's tons more I have, but we only have time for a few more. Um, and I'll close it um, on, on something that I honestly struggled with a great deal when I um, left the military and became a consultant. Because, um, you know, as we all know, you know, whether you're in the military or not, if you're not used to working remotely, it seems like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And, you know, I get to work in my pajamas and I'm going to have all this free time and I can travel. And, and maybe you can. I, I wear my pajamas on occasion and, and I do, you know, I'm, I'm traveling right now. But, but there is... Um, there's a lot of stress involved and it is a different dynamic where you can get yourself into trouble with overworking if you're not careful due to the nature of, of the environment, right? Because you live with your work now. So um, we discuss life-work balance and I put the life first intentionally during these office hours because it's, it's incredibly important. So, you know, real brief, you know, one or two things. Can you share kind of your, your challenges, success, failure strategies for, for how you're creating that sustainable balance between the demands of your new role and the needs of your family, loved ones, you know, pets, your, and, and yourself. Yeah. So <clears throat> I know some people are morning gym people. I'm not a morning gym person, but I, uh, it, and this kind of is down to company culture too. But like, I know like at five o'clock every day, 
uh, my boss knows I pretty much have a hard stop. And like, I'm going to be at the gym. So like, I've even like, I've like trained him. So like even a couple of days ago, he's like, oh, Justin, like, aren't you supposed to be at the gym right now? And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm a little late today. So uh, yet again, that's some of that's company culture. But I think if you um, kind of set a hard line for yourself and for your coworkers, uh, then you know what to expect from yourself on your day-to-day schedule, uh, whether it's going to pick up your kids or go to the gym or whatever. Uh, or, and then your, uh, your coworkers and your management can know um, what to expect from you as well. The work will always be there uh, tomorrow, right? So you can always maybe start your day earlier or work more, et cetera. But like at five o'clock, I know I'm going to close the computer, uh, so to speak, and I head out to the gym and that's the end of my day. So that's all I do. Awesome. What other thoughts? Yeah, I think to go up, like communicating, because most companies I think are fairly, are fairly receptive as long as you communicate, as long as it doesn't get in the way of your delivery. So if you want to go to the gym in the morning or at the end of the day, communicate that with your team. And as long as it doesn't interrupt the delivery of your team and your work, then more often than not, I've seen that no matter what that thing is, it's generally okay. So just be try and communicate it first. If it doesn't fly, then it doesn't fly. But don't just not show up in the morning and be like, oh, I was I had an appointment and I didn't tell anybody. You have to communicate it. Keep your That's calendar the most important updated. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so simple. If you have an updated calendar that's up to date, you will not get in trouble 99% of the time. It's yeah. the people and then who I think, and they don't show. Yeah. And then another thing I think is important is setting a routine for yourself because it's so easy to get sucked into your computer for eight hours and you're like, where'd the day go? Um, having a routine, having things you enjoy, taking a break for lunch, going for a walk. It's harder in the winter for some of us who are in the north. Um, but stepping away during the day is also a very good way to to, to break the day up. Totally agree. Sometimes. And I, I think you have to really use your calendar to your advantage. Block it out. Block out email slash housekeeping time. Block out heads down project time. Block out your lunch. <laughs> and then I agree, have a hard stop. Be ready to enforce that hard stop. I've set boundaries and communicated them, like you mentioned, Nick and Justin, and I've gotten really good feedback on that. And so I think people appreciate that. It helps them set boundaries too for themselves. I'm the world's worst at this. I've struggled tremendously with it. Everyone's saying all the right things and I've tried and I, and I'm still doing, but I'm doing better, but I have to set alarms because I'll have in my mind, I got a hard stop. I've blocked my calendar, but then like, I'll still be in the, in the computer and the work. And it, the, the thing that helps me the most is setting an alarm and then it will like get me out of my focus. And I will make, I have to get outside. Like, so knowing yourself, whatever that, is for you um, to to physically remove yourself from your computer. Any thoughts, Megan? Any any final 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 ideas on the on the life work balance? I know you've got some. Well, when Kayla was talking about a timer, um, I use this. Uh, it it has like uh, the the color for you, so. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a good visual. It sits right here. And if I know I've only got one hour to really focus on a project, it helps me divide my whole day up into small chunks of time where I'm more productive than if I wasn't setting that timer and knowing that it was, you know, that color is getting smaller and smaller. So um, timers are great. Yeah, whatever method works for you. I, I love that timer idea. But, you know, the, the takeaways are, and, and a couple couple of our panelists have said it, train your train your boss, train your your coworkers, train your peers, and don't be afraid to, to to Katrina's point to defend that time. So if someone asks you, hey, you know, it's 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 505 in Justin's day, like, hey, can you jump on this real quick? Nope, I'm at the gym, sorry. Uh, but you know, like maybe provide them an alternative. Hey, you know, I, I can be on it tomorrow at eight, you know. So do the follow-up with them so they know that um, you're gonna get to it, but you know, that that you need to do um, that you're having, you know, work life balance time, whatever. Um, and over time, they will get to know you and they will not make unreasonable requests. There's always going to be emergencies and you have to be sensitive to that, you know, when things are like on fire and there's there's something in, is in production that doesn't work. Okay, great. But for the most part, training your, your coworkers and your boss will work wonders and focus time as your friend. Um, put it in your calendar. Multiple folks have said that. But to Kayla's point, you know, we're our own worst enemies when it comes to that. The hardest part is not really training your boss, it's training yourself to go, hey, it's five, I'm out, I'm at the gym. Because we always wanna help people, we always wanna do great work. 
and that flow just broke at five, you know, five Oh one. You're like, Oh, I want to fix it. Nope. Go to the gym. So, um, all great points. This has been an awesome hour before we do close. I want to thank Justin, Kayla, Ryan, Megan, Nick, and Katrina for uh, an awesome hour, uh, letting us know what it's, you know, what their tips and tricks are for, for crushing it the first days, first 90 days. of the system. So thank you so much. Thank you.